If you would have asked me five years ago what the on-trend brewing thing would be in 2021, I never would have guessed that hard seltzer water would be so popular. Laugh all you want, but hard seltzer is a fantastic day drinker and likely isn't going anywhere in the near future. Imperial Yeast's new seasonal strain, W04 Paramount, can help brewers get the most out of their seltzer fermentations. A clean and aggressive fermenter, Paramount will produce an excellent seltzer with low fusel alcohols and it's produced in a gluten-free medium. If you've tried making seltzer with standard ale or lager strains, you know the struggle, and Imperial Yeast is here to help with W04 Paramount. Check it out at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. The discovery of new things is one of the coolest and most interesting parts of being a scientist, in my opinion. It's one of the reasons why I love sci-fi books and shows, and hey, one of the reasons I love being a brewing scientist. Uh, Despite all we know about yeast after studying it for almost 200 years, there are still new brewing yeasts out there to be discovered. I'm your host, Cade Job, and today I'm back in the lab with my co-host, Jordan Folks, as we apply the science from the last episode, yeast foraging, harvesting, isolating, and selection, with Tim Faith and Alex Nam. Jordan, welcome back to the lab. Yeah, I think that discovering new things in homebrewing is one of the really attractive things in the hobby, right? You know, we really can make the next great style, uh, the next great ingredient combination. And when it comes to the commercial offerings that are out there, yeast seems to be one of the ones that's constantly evolving. There's constantly new things to try out. And, you know, as I think we'll dig into this episode, not that it's easy, but maybe it's just a little bit quicker than, say, developing the great new barley variety or the next, you know, (laughs) sexy hop. Yeah, for sure. I mean, or even, you know, people listening to the show might be the next great brewery, right? I mean, you never know. I mean, so many breweries have been started by home brewers. I mean, Sierra Nevada is one of the largest breweries in the country now, started by a home brewer, uh, you know, in a garage in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, but, you know, so yeah, I mean, this it, it, this is really cool. Discovery is awesome. And as home brewers, you really can uh, discover a lot of things. And we talked about on the episode, you know, a lot of commercial practices uh, and things about like how you would apply this in a commercial brewery and stuff. And today we're going to focus a little bit more on the homebrewing side of this. But still, you know, if you're a small brewery that maybe doesn't have access to some of the equipment that Goose Island does, pay attention because this is going to be a fun episode. And uh, Jordan, you're actually just back from NHC, right? The National Homebrew uh, uh, National Homebrew Convention. That's what it is, right? Uh, th- well, that's what I still call it, but I guess they call it homebrew con now. But yeah, uh, it was a really great time. Uh, and p- all the yeast labs were there and, um, really cool, uh, time to be a homebrewer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you ever actually harvested yeast? Well, let's see. Um, I've definitely made mixed fermentation beers using, uh, bottled dregs. Um, and in fact, my, uh, Lambic project, or lambic inspired project leans heavily on dregs that I uh, or a culture that I harvested up from Cantillon and uh, Dre Fontaine and uh, bottles. Um, I have done one wild capture as well. It did not turn out good. Um, and we can talk more <laughs> yeah. in the episode about w- what you're looking for when doing uh, this kind of thing. But I've never actually like streaked a plate or anything like that. It's always kind of been a bulk starter approach. I do not own a microscope. Well, which is totally okay, too, right? That's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up right at the front, too, is because bottle dregs, harvesting bottle dregs, that counts. That's what we're talking about in this show, right? Is finding and discovering, uh, you know, new yeasts in your brewery or, or getting access to yeast that you may not actually have access to. This episode was a fun one, and I hope it piqued some people's interest about micro and harvesting, ye- harvesting yeast. Uh, but we'll get there in just a few minutes. But first, if you're not already a patron of Brewlosophy, please consider becoming one. We really appreciate all of the support that we get from our awesome patrons. And as a reward for your support, you get awesome things like access to unpublished contributor recipes, discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, an invite to a monthly live Q&A session. And becoming a patron is easy. There's no obligation. You can cancel at any time. But if you're out there listening to the show and the Brewlosophy podcast and listening, doing, you know, reading all of the other fun things we're up to, like experiments, short and shoddy, hop chronicles, brew it yourself, and the all new Brewlosophy show on YouTube, uh, please consider uh, supporting supporting us and becoming a patron. This month's Q&A guest is actually Jamil Zanishev, author of Brewing Classic Styles, host of Brew Strong and other shows on the Brewing Network, and founder and former owner of Heretic Brewing in California. Jamil is a true home brewing legend. Uh, you don't want to miss this. And if you haven't checked out Brewing Classic Styles or know that book, 
Jamil is the guy that brewed a gold medal in all of the BJCP styles and then published his recipes. Uh, so yeah, he's a really cool guy, knows a lot of information. You can find more information on how to become a patron and catch Jamil uh, at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. You can also support us by using the links at brewlosophy.com slash support. Start your shopping experience by clicking those links and we get a small kickback. Every little bit helps and it doesn't change your shopping experience at all. And again, all you have to do is find those affiliate links at brewlosophy.com slash support at the start of your shopping experience. Feedback is brought to you by the imaginative crew at Haas who have developed a revolutionary way to develop uh, to dry hop using Spectrum, a flowable 100% hop derived product that's fully dispersible in cold side applications for great flavor, efficiency, and less beer loss. No solids means less loss and it's fully dispersible in cold beer, so there's no contact or residency time required like traditional dry hopping. Spectrum fully disperses immediately, so you don't need to wait 24 to 48 hours or worry about double dry hopping and you don't have to have any special dry hopping equipment. It stores easily, it's easy to use, saving you precious time and getting instant aroma in each batch. It's currently available to commercial brewers in trial quantities like Citra and Mosaic, so check it out by visiting johnihaas.com. That's john, the letter I, H-A-A-S dot com. All right, listener, uh, Brian, um, author of the Sui Generous Brewing blog, which is an awesome blog. I encourage everybody to check that out. He wrote it and said, Caden Jordan, I just finished listening to your podcast on GMO yeast and you made a few errors that you may want to correct. Um, so short note, Brian had several comments about the show and we're going to address one, one of those today um, and then we'll catch on, um, the rest on later episodes. He had some really good things to say. And so Brian says, early in the podcast, Cade states that yeast do not evolve as they are not sexually reproducing and quite emphatically stating that yeast do not evolve in the brewery. This is wildly incorrect. Sexual reproduction is not required for evolution to occur. If anything, it slows evolution down as new mutations get diluted across the population. Yeast mutation rates do vary with strain and growth conditions, but on average, they mutate one DNA base pair per hundred million base pairs per cell division. In practical terms, that means if you were to pull just one mil of fermenting beer, that one mil would have five to ten yeast with a novel mutation not present in the original pitch. And it doesn't take much of a growth benefit for a new mutant to become a dominant strain in the brewery. In addition, how yeasts are managed in the brewery can drive selection. For example, if you repitch and continually harvest from the bottom of a conical fermenter, you'll likely select for a less attenuative mutants. Even if you keep conditions exactly the same pitch to pitch and harvest yeast properly, change is inevitable as genetic drift is a, power, a powerful evolutionary force that takes hold when selection forces are low and absent. Uh, all right, cool. Hey, say thanks, Brian. Um, thanks for that comment. There's a lot of really good information in there about um, genetic drift. Uh, my point when bringing all that stuff up about genetic drift was just to state that genetic drift, while it can be a powerful evolutionary tool, um, and, and and while it certainly does happen, uh, I'm not sure that it's happening as often as most brewers think, and I'm not sure that it's happening as often as that one mil, um, you know, five to ten yeast in a mil of, of beer. And the reason why is there's a study back in 2007 by Lalamond, which is published in the Journal of the Institute of Brewing. And in that study, researchers serially repitched Bridgeport Brewing's ale strain 98 times, and they repitched their lager strain 135 times serially, right? So this is not a new, this is, uh, you know, over and over, harvesting and repitching, harvesting, repitching, harvesting, repitching. Uh, they, they ran it through all the, the DNA tests, and they saw no genetic drift at all. They saw zero um, genetic drift. No change in fermentation characters characteristics. And granted, this is just two yeast strains, and so yeasts are, some yeasts are more susceptible to genetic drift than others. But there are also anecdotal reports of European brewers that have been serially repitching for decades, um, hundreds of fermentations without any uh, genetic drift. So it's interesting, right? So this this whole concept of genetic drift is 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 somewhat complicated and again i'm not a microbiologist so i don't want to get out over my skis but my point was comparing this with sexual reproduction right when sexual reproduction you're literally combining the genomes of two different yeast strains and you're going to make new yeast right every time that you do that and then, so that's for example like the imperialis project at imperial or the nova lager strain from lalamon that avi mentioned on the gmo podcast where they make hybrids using sexual reproduction those are totally new yeast strains with 
with novel ge- novel brewing characteristics. Um, and so, again, my point isn't to say that genetic drift doesn't occur. It can and does. I just don't think it's happening as likely as much as brewers think. I, I think a lot of brewers in, in cereal repitching when things are changing, my guess is it's more often coming from a new microorganism that got in there. Maybe just a single cell that was in the first harvest that grows up when you repitch the culture. Um, and again, I'm not saying genetic drift doesn't occur. I'm just saying it may not occur as much as brewers think. And that's kind of why I was so emphatic about that comment in the podcast, just that um, maybe genetic drift isn't happening as much as brewers think. But uh, anyway, thanks for the comment. Jordan, anything to add about that? Yeah, I mean, I guess this makes me think that even if it is happening, maybe it's the effect is fairly minor on the resulting beverage. Uh, like Brian mentioned, you know, maybe a little less attenuation, et cetera. But it's not like, uh, you know, a couple generations in your Chico has transformed into a Saison strain. It's maybe <laughs> yeah. not as like super character- characteristic or obvious in that regard. Yeah, for sure. That's a really good point. I think maybe Brian would agree with that, too. I don't know. I don't want to speak for him. Uh, But yeah, you know, um, mutations are going to happen, right? I mean, yeast is going to mutate and each yeast is going to mutate differently than other yeasts. Um, But yeah, again, that was all I was trying to say in that. So thanks, Brian, for uh, reaching out and uh, raising that comment. We got a couple other comments from Brian, like I said, that we'll get to in future shows. All right. After this, we'll be right back. Uh, We're going to talk about harvesting, isolating and selecting yeasts from the wild. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. Are you opening a brewery or have you already? Did you know More Beer has a pro division? Morebeerpro.com is your brewery or brewery in planning one-stop shop for all your brewing needs. From complete brew houses and accessories to fermentation and even cooperage, they've got you covered. More Beer also has the largest selection of malt, hops, chemicals, and other brewing products of any vendor at low wholesale prices, all of which can be delivered on the same pallet, saving you and your brewery even more on shipping costs. Visit morebeerpro.com today. Today to sign up for an account and talk with one of their knowledgeable brewery consultants. Right on the heels of an episode about genetically engineered or genetically modified yeast, we had an episode about the more conventional method of discovering new yeasts, harvesting them from the wild. I think this tells a pretty good, cool story uh, about yeast discovery and the way that we can explore new and novel ingredients. Don't you think so, Jordan? Totally. And I'm really into this idea of discovery and experimentation with yeast. I thought it was a really great episode. Yeah, I was really excited about it too. And the one of the things I was most excited and I talked about it on the episode is its applicability to all brewers, right? Anyone can do this. I, I mean, these, the, you know, of course, they had access to Goose Island equipment and, you know, micro lab and all that sort of stuff and streak plating and, you know, <laughs> trained microbiologists to, to, to do the work here. Um, but they presented it in a way that I thought was actually really useful and really interesting. And so we're going to talk about it a little bit and also kind of apply a more homebrewing bit. Uh, today in today's episode. But I wanted to start off the top of the show with a question that I asked them and just kind of get your and my thoughts on it. It's why would brewers want to harvest their own yeast? What do you think? So is a clarifying question there. You mean from the wild as opposed to repitching cereal or something like that, right? Sure. Or well, I mean, I guess uh, I would say like as opposed to just buying yeast from Imperial or buying yeast from, you know, uh, Chico or, or, you know, buying yeast from uh, White Labs or, or Lalamond or any of the mm-hmm. yeast mm-hmm. companies, Omega, you know, uh, why would you want to just, you know, go out and harvest your own yeast or find, you know, harvest bottle dregs or something like that rather than just buying something that's commercial pitch and just pitch it straight in? Right. There's a few different scenarios and a few different reasons, right? So I think that um, one of the reasons why brewers, mostly um, professional brewers, but some home brewers like myself, repitch uh, from uh, a fermentation into the next fermentation is just a cost-saving mechanism, right? It would be very expensive for a brewery to be uh, pitching a new, fresh 
pitch from the lab every brew, um, especially when you're brewing all the time. Um, but from a home brewer's perspective, it's really not that hard to save a jar of yeast and use it later. Um, and as long as your sanitation is right, you know, you can save a little bit of money there too. Uh, similarly, especially from the homebrew scale, there could be some kind of rare boutique strain or culture that you acquired. That's not readily available at the homebrew store every day. And you want to, you know, give that a few turns instead of just like one and done it could be something that's never going to come out ever again, like a beta strain. And, um, so I think that really cost savings or preserving novel strains is why we'd repitch from the fermenter. But in terms of harvesting, let's say bottle dregs, uh, it could be that there is a purer or more original source, right? Like I remember back in the day, people were harvesting up bottle dregs from Sierra Nevada bottles to have like <laughs> the OG Chico strain. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that there are like rumors that maybe there is a more pure Kolsch strain out there than what the labs are providing us. And so maybe you could get that from a bottle. Um, so I think that trying or, or, you know, some cool Lambic beer or something like that, that there's no commercial source available. Uh, that, that is how you could get that there. So I think that, um, that's another, way or reason that people would be harvesting is just access to things you can't easily buy on the market. And then I think the third one, which is truly from the wild is just this excitement of the unknown, you know, <laughs> maybe, yeah. I mean, it could just be, you know, a pat on your shoulder. Hey, we did it. Or it really could be that you've discovered the next great strain. Um, and you know, you can only, you know, what, what's the phrase? You only miss the shots. You, take <laughs> or something like take. that right yeah 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 you and only miss you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take there it is yeah exactly <laughs> right right and yeah. so if we don't look in the wild for new yeast strains we're never going to find them yeah yeah i mean and you think about like the yeast harvesting success story that everybody talks about it's philly sour right i mean i i had him on the podcast uh you know talking about uh the 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 uh story about the discovery of philly sour and i mean it's it, like the the yeast name i don't remember the full number but it's like gy8 or something like that which is graveyard strain eight right it was in an intro microbiology class some students went out into a graveyard swabbed a tree they brought it back in isolated it and then found this in this yeast a lachancia thermotolerance yeast that also that not only ferments uh sugars into alcohol but it also creates lactic acid at the same time which is super cool and super interesting right i mean this is just a a, a basic micro micro class i mean this happens across the country probably like three or four times a year um in every university that has a microbiology department i mean it's like this is um a, a, you know it's kind of a basic micro skill to learn and we've got this awesome strain, Philly Sour, out of it. I mean, it's really cool, this discovery of new things. I mean, you listen to Alex and Tim's story about what they were doing, and Goose Island challenges the employees to make a new and novel beer, right? Like, make the next great beer, or make a beer that's just new and interesting. And so what did they do? They said, well, let's go see if we can find a yeast out in the wild. So they went, they wanted to go camping, <laughs> so they went out into the wild and harvested uh, this yeast, or, or really everything. So they, they harvested way more than just yeast. I mean, molds and who knows what else, bacteria and all kinds of things, but looking for an interesting yeast. And so that's kind of an interesting point too. So you, you had mentioned like bottle dregs as like finding something that, that, you know, um, is unique that people maybe don't have, uh, you know, or, or like going out into the wild and harvesting something totally new. Um, and Alex and Tim focused on yeast, but there are other organisms that you can harvest like lactobacillus bread uh britannomyces pediococcus other things in beer um that might actually give you interesting flavors uh to your beer i mean there's probably there's got to be a lot more brett britannomyces strains out there than are commercially available right um i mean there's 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 just got to be i mean there's not very many britannomyces strains that are commercially available so if you're looking for you know some like um more interesting puff flavors or clove or spicy or even some barnyard and you know some fun uh, to your beer, you know, you might go out and want to harvest a Brett strain or, you know, maybe you can find the next lactobacillus strain that's not oxygen sensitive or not hop sensitive or something. And then, um, you know, then you've got the next new strain. But there's so many ways that you can go. And really, I, I just think it's really cool. Like the discovery of yeast. I just think that's fun. Yeah. And like the Philly sour example, maybe you could even discover a organism that we don't historically associate with brewing and that actually has a really good form and function there. And so the 
clearly sack lacto breton pedio is not the end game and that there's a whole world of possibilities literally out there just waiting to be discovered Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, this is the a thermal tolerance. I mean, obviously, if you're doing this at home, you're probably not going to have the ability to like identify the exact strain or species of whatever it is that you're harvesting. But that's totally OK. I'm sure if you send it somewhere, they might um, be interested in, in sequencing it for you if you think you've got something that's truly unique or something that you really like. Um, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the like the discovery, the, the method that Tim and Alex were talking about. And then the second half of the show, we'll dive like way more down into the details and talk about some like you know best practices maybe some ideas and things um that you can do at home if you're interested in doing this but first thing i have to say and this was a big takeaway for me is if you're going to go down this path holy moly it's a lot of work (laughs) i mean i don't know if you shared the same takeaway but that was one of the big ones for me yeah no i think i kind of knew that going into it having followed this idea for a while now um and I was honestly impressed that they found something with as few samples as they had. Yeah, that's true, right? It was like 46 or something like that. That was what they started with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have been surprised if it took a thousand to find a good one. And I guess they only brewed one beer out of it. Well, yeah. I mean, well, because they only got down to two yeasts, right? I mean, right. after all the selection processes that they went through, they got down to two to two yeasts and that was it. I mean, that's impressive too, right? The, to find a yeast that they were actually able to brew with that made a good beer out of 46 or 47, however many it was, um, samples. But so, okay, here's a quick overview of the method and then we can talk about it a little bit more. Uh, but so the first thing you have to do is actually go out and collect your samples, right? So go into the field or go into the graveyard or the campground um, and swab something and collect it. That's going to be a mess, right? It's going to be a soupy mess. It's going to be a whole bunch of different organisms organisms. So then you have to isolate those. And they did something called serial streak plating. Um, If you don't know what that is, that's okay. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there. It's not very difficult to do once you've got the uh, the method down, but it's all about isolating a single yeast. Or if you're looking for botanomyces, bread or pedio or lacto or whatever it is that you're looking for, it's isolating it down to get just one colony. So that's where they did. That's where they got um, 46 or was it? No, 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 that's not right. They got uh, less than they started with 46 samples and they narrowed that down to like 13 or 14 individual yeast isolates. So then you have to take those isolates and actually grow them up. And they did what what I thought was a fantastic method. It's a drive-by sensory, right? And I was like, oh man, that's so smart. Like we're not going to spend all this other time brewing and growing up these, these um, yeasts unless they give us the characteristics that I want. So you do the drive-by sensory and then you brew with it. Essentially, you make sure it can actually make beer. You check the pH, you know, you, you make sure that it's a capable of attenuating and, and consuming maltose, which a lot of yeasts aren't able to do. Uh, and then you brew a beer with it and see what it tastes like. So, I mean, it seems like, like, it's really like, if you think, if you just kind of like narrow it down to four steps, it's like, oh, that's super easy. I can do that. But <laughs> It's actually a little bit more detailed. But that drive Drive-by sensory evaluation, maybe we should spend a couple of seconds there because I thought that was really interesting. So like what kinds of things, Jordan, would you think to look at if you were if you were trying to just like, you know, if you were interested in harvesting a yeast, what would harvesting a yeast from the wild, what would you look for? Well, uh, definitely smell would be one of the first things, right? And I think also visual, right? Does it is it visually fermenting? Um, Is it dropping clear, et cetera? Um, Does it smell okay? I think that it's probably wise to take a pH reading and a gravity reading before tasting it. Um, But if it smells super putrid, just move on. Just dump it. You don't need to (laughs) even measure anything. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be some yeasts out there that are just stinky and gross, right? We know that happens because if anybody's ever had an infection, you know, or not, I'm not going to call it an infection, a contamination. You've actually got an unwanted yeast in a batch. Yeah, it can turn stinky. I'll never forget. That was my second batch of beer that I ever brewed. I've told this story before on the Brewlosophy podcast, but it was a Mr. Beer kit. And uh, the Mr. Beer kit comes with a cleanser. Um, So you clean like the inside of the fermentation, you know, I don't know, plastic keg that they give you. But there's no sanitizer that's involved. Right. Um, It's just this cleanser. So he's like, okay, clean the inside of the thing and then put your beer straight in there. Um, And for some reason, uh, the cleanser didn't clean everything out. I, I had something nasty 
in my in my fermenter. And I remember I put it in a closet and whenever I opened the door to that closet, I just went, oh my God, it smelled like a stinky gym sock. Like it was gross. I don't know what it was, but who knows? I mean, something just fell in there and totally ruined that batch. Did you bottle it? No, no way. No, I no, 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 no. I was so excited. My first beer that I made was like, I mean, I don't know. It probably wasn't very good, but it was good to me. I was so excited that I was like, okay, no, no, no. We're just doing this again. Like this one's crap. Figure it out. Let's just do this again and see if I can recreate the first batch. Yeah. Knowing me, my second batch, I probably still would have bottled it, but maybe it wouldn't be able to choke the bottles down. Yeah, no, it was terrible. It was really, really bad. Like, uh, I mean, when I say like sweaty gym sock, I mean like the worst version of Britannomyces probably you've ever smelled. Like any, I mean, it was just nasty. It and was when was this, by the way? Oh, gosh. Uh, 2012, okay. maybe 2011. That's about like when that. I started homebrewing as well. And uh, a bit of a side here, but I can't wonder what first time homebrew batches taste like in 2023 you know oh, like does mr beer even <laughs> exist anymore i don't know but like i know that people are they're like i'd like to try homebrewing i'm gonna buy a grandfather you know it's just like all in ones didn't exist back then uh we didn't have all the knowledge all the books all the internet uh, brewlosophy didn't exist in 2012 right and so uh i just kind of wonder if like first batches of beer aren't as notoriously bad as they were 10 years ago yeah, I don't know. If there's a listener out there that's been recently that's a recent brewer, that'd be really interesting. I'd I'd love to know that. I mean, think about it too, like the Mr. Beer kits, like or, or not Mr. Beer, more beer kits, where which are like, you know, you've got the whole range now. You've got full extract, you've got partial, you've got full, you know, all grain. I mean, whatever you want. You can just go on more beer and buy uh whatever kit that you want, which is awesome. Um, okay, total aside, back to yeast. Um and and so one of the other things that I thought was really interesting about this show, uh or and what they did in the MBAA TQ article. So Alex and Tim actually wrote out everything. They wrote out all of the steps that are necessary if you want to go and harvest your yeast and then use it in a large commercial scale fermentation. And when I say large, I, I want to say, I think they, it was 1,500 barrels, I think is what they said. That wow. They did. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, it's a huge, huge pilot, a huge scale fermentation. But that really drove something home for me is the especially like the latter half of everything that they had to do. So when they did after they did their drive by sensory, they put it through a full battery of tests because as a commercial brewer, you can't dump a fifteen hundred. Well, you can dump a fifteen hundred barrel <laughs> batch of beer, but oof, I don't want to be that guy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so uh, but so this kind of drove home a point to me home brewers have a lot of opportunity here right and you even mentioned that at the top of the show jordan right yeah i mean i the time i did a wild capture uh with the intention of discovering a new yeast it was a gallon right and uh didn't smell good it didn't taste good i didn't swallow it but i like kind of put my mouth and instantly (laughs) spat it out uh i i think it fermented you know 50 percent attenuation or something i don't i can't remember if the ph was uh uh scary high or anything like that but it didn't pass the sniff test or the analytical test either but it was a gallon you know so it's like what do you got to lose at that point yeah exactly well and i was thinking about this too like you were at homebrew con and i was thinking that you know like homebrew con is great for sharing ideas and like you know coming up with new things to take back to your home club and i was thinking like this would be a really fun project for a homebrew club right? Like a good long-term like club building project is like, okay, as a club, we're going to do this. We're going to go and like harvest some yeast or like each person can go harvest some yeast wherever they want. And then, you know, for our meeting, we'll come together and streak plate or who knows. I mean, you you, you don't even have to get that detailed, right? You can do just, we're going to come home and stick the swab in some beer and, <laughs> and see if it ferments, um, you know, uh, any of those things. But this could actually be a really fun project for a homebrew club or even just an individual homebrewer. I mean, Jordan, you've mentioned that you were interested in harvesting for bottle dregs as part of your, you know, um, sour program. Right. Yeah, I've done that and it, and it works really well. Um, and then obviously the Belgian tradition of the cool ship is something that people can try at home as well. Um, there was a homebrew con presentation from Pure Project Brewing in San Diego where they talked about their spontaneous beers and uh, they had it... Uh, there for us a sample and it really tasted very belgian lambic esque and uh what i was interested to learn from their presentation is they actually clean their barrels in between each 
uh, use. So the, each spontaneous beer that they're producing ostensibly truly is from that night's nighttime error. It's not because I would think that you would just kind of like lean into the barrels, at, you know, once you have your culture established and like let that do some of the heavy lifting. No, they're starting from a clean slate every time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and again, that's a really cool example. Cool shipping, right? That's something that's another great way to uh, have, uh, you know, harvest yeast. Uh, you don't even need a swab, right? You just put your beer outside in some kind of like shallow open container and let whatever microbes are outside fall in. Something is going to ferment uh, whenever it goes in. <laughs> it's risky, right? You might be dumping five gallons of beer or in your case, a gallon, but you have all of this opportunity. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about some of the benefits of like home homebrew experimentation in this area versus commercial uh, experimentation in this area. And I, one of the things that I thought would be really interesting is this pursuit of a house culture. You know, like you could really do that as a home brewer. Everybody, you know, every every brewer wants to talk about their house strain, right, of yeast, and and that that may be Chico, or it may be a unique yeast strain that they have, right, that's unique to them. Um, at least here in the United States, I know in Europe there's very much more like breweries have their own unique unique strains and they protect those strains but you could also do that as a home brewer like develop your house culture your house flavor or your um terroir right your area uh because these are the whatever the microbes were that grew in your beer and it doesn't have to be a sour beer it doesn't have to be a sour sp uh, of uh, spontaneous fermentation it could just be an interesting novel yeast that's located in portland for example jordan or here in corvallis or back in austin in texas Right. But unless you're pulling out the microscope or at least like streaking plates, et cetera, you're probably going to have a mixed culture on your hands. And not every mixed culture is going to make sour beer. And we can, uh, you know, there are levers that we can pull um, in a given direction to mitigate that, right? Like hops um, and, and try to train out the um, lacto or something like that. But if you're just capturing from the wild, be it a spontaneous capture like an open vessel or like throwing in some blackberries or something and trying to get what's on the, the fruit skin, etc., odds are you're going to have a mixed culture on your hands. And so that's when you kind of need to start looking into some sort of even rudimentary scientific equipment to isolate a specific strain if you want a uh, house strain as opposed to a house culture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A house yeast. And that's important, right? If we're talking about a house yeast, which is exactly what Tim and Alex did in the episode, is finding a yeast. And so that's where you kind of have this flip side, right? And so there are benefits of experimentation because of your scale as a home brewer. Like you can dump a five gallon batch and it's okay if it tastes like crap. That's fine. Um, you know, nobody's going to, it's not huge volumes and it's not a huge amount of money but on the flip side some breweries especially like goose island they're going to have a lot better technology um in terms of yeast management and also in terms of streak plating and maybe people who've done it before and and technique and all that kind of stuff right i mean goose island they have a lab um yeah and i uh, right historically uh there was that incident of half a decade ago or so where they had uh bourbon county got infected and they had to recall a bunch of bottles. Um, and with barrels, you know, that is a tough game, barrel-aged stout, because a barrel-aged Lambic, you're, you know, the intention is it gets sour, but you don't <laughs> want your stout to get sour. And so barrels are so tough. And so Goose Island, you know, found this out and, you know, recalled it and offered to refund everyone. But that laboratory, you know, that's where they're able to find these things out. And so they clearly have the experience, they have the technology, they have the power. Uh, so they're, you know, really set up well to lean into their laboratory staff and develop this kind of stuff. Small breweries don't necessarily have that, you know, not every small brewery even has a microscope. Right, exactly. Yeah, not even every small brewery has a microscope. That's totally true. Um, I would encourage you, though, if you are a small brewery, I would encourage you to get a microscope because it can help you troubleshoot a lot of problems. And microscopes are inexpensive. We're not talking about a DO meter that's $10,000. Microscopes are maybe a couple hundred bucks. Um, you know, so it's totally a piece of equipment that you can easily add to your brewery. And also home brewers, too. Like, there are cheaper microscopes out there, too, that might be what good enough um, to, to help you in this 
business aspect. But the other thing too is partnerships. Your local university would probably love to have you come in and like show you show you you know the use of the microscope or whatever. I mean, they'd love to like find a new strain. I mean, microbiologists love this. It's like, it's like card collecting for microbiologists. I think right. <laughs> it's like finding new strains. But one of the easiest ways that you can start, and Jordan, you mentioned it already, and you have some experience in it. It's harvesting from bottle dregs. That's one of the easiest ways that you can have very limited um, equipment and still find a specific or unique strain that you like might not be able to get from somewhere else. So it, I think that's a great way to start. Don't you think, Jordan? Oh, yeah. It's 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 really easy. Um, it I think that historically, or at least recently, homebrewers have really been interested in sour dregs. You don't hear these days too much people talking about um, like harvesting from Sierra Nevada to buy Chico or to get Chico. They'll just buy a pack from Imperial or Y Easter, whomever. Um, but it, it's super easy to do and you can do it with clean beers as well. Uh, maybe like Saison DuPont, you know, maybe that would be a good way to get that strain and see if you could uh, actually not get it to stall if it's coming straight from the bottle. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's pretty simple. You know, you're just going to want to um, uh, not drink the last you know, half inch of the bottle or the can. Clearly it needs to be a, a beer that's uh, actually has some sort of culture at the bottom of it. Um, if it's a crystal clear lager all the way to the last like drop out of the can or the bottle, probably not the best choice for trying to um, isolate and build up yeast from it. But, um, uh, but bottle conditioned beers are a great example. Um, you got to be careful because there's always the possibility that the um, strain at the bottom of the bottle is not the one that ferments the beer, but it could be a bottle conditioning strain. Uh, I think that there are some Hefeweizen brewers that might use lager yeast as their bottle conditioning strain. So that doesn't do you a lot of favors if you're trying to build up a really uh, nice, uh, characterful uh, Hefeweizen strain. But um, yeah, so you just want to uh, not drink the last half inch or so. Uh, use a, I've heard, you know, use a flame, like use a lighter to kind of light the tip of the bottle. I guess if it's a can, you probably can't do that or maybe shouldn't. Um, but then sanitize it as well with a uh, spray some sanitizer on it and then pour decant that last little bit, you know, swirl it up, try to get it all out, decant it into a very small amount of wort. Um, so 1030, 1040, uh, so what's that, 10 Plato or so, um, is approximately the strength of the wort that you want to add. And uh, just a single bottle isn't going to give you that much. So if you can even do an entire six pack or a few bottles of the same uh, variety, like have a party or a dinner or something, and then just save them all for the end, uh, that's going to give you more to work with. And so you kind of want to scale up depending on how many bottles you're pouring in. But something really small, like a half cup, cup of wort um, is all you really need. And what I've heard is that you want to do a one to 10 ratio. So you want to build that up sub uh, sequentially um, at a one to 10. So if you start with a, uh, like a half cup, then you want to do five cups on the next generation. And that is how you can really build that cell mass. So it's not going to be uh, a single bottle of Saison DuPont into a teaspoon of wort is not going to give you a pitchable quantity. So you might need a few generations of building up to get a pitchable quantity. Um, and along the way, do those drive-by sensories. Is it smelling okay? Is it looking okay? Um, if it's not turning cloudy, then you know you might not be getting a fermentation. Uh, if it won't drop clear, then maybe you know you only have the least flocculent cells. Um, look at pH. Uh, look at gravity. Um, and it's tough when you're working in such small amounts. So you might actually need to get a few um, generations in before you have enough, uh, you know, the discarded wort, uh, fermented wort to even actually take, a, you know, a gravity measurement. But once you're starting to get that cell mass and you're passing these kind of sensory and um, objective measurable, uh, you know, characteristics, you're off to the races and then it's time to put it in a real beer. Yeah, exactly. And so you've done that um, for your for your sour program, right? I mean, that's how you got the strain that you currently brew with. Uh, it's how I got my uh, lambic culture as well. But I, it's a little bit of both actually on that. So I did that with um, uh, Belgian lambic dregs and um, it smelled like lambic. So that was a really good uh, sign. <laughs> but just to add a little bit of local flair, I will do a cool ship kind of thing um, the night of the brew day. But then the next day I go ahead and pitch my um, Lambic culture that I built up from Belgian bottles to really give it the uh, insurance that it's going to do what I want it to do. But maybe I'm getting something from the nighter as well to kind of add a little bit of local tour. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Adding a little bit of local terroir is also really nice. Um, you know, but again, that's how you did it, right? You want it. You love Belgian lambics, and so that's a source where those bottles are bottle conditioned. I mean, that's a key thing. If the bottle's filtered, or if it's centrifuge, or if it's used in finings, or something like that, um, you know, not a good candidate for harvesting from yeast dregs. Um, and and like you said, you may want to be careful too because some of the strain might be totally different, right? I, I think um, uh, there's a there's a, one of the saisons. I can't remember which one it is it's one of the popular saisons it bottle conditions with champagne yeast because it's very very uh easy it's a good attenuator um it produces nice effervescence um tight bubbles and i had a friend do that with the saison he was trying to get the saison strain and he uh fermented with well it didn't really um ferment very well <laughs> in a, in a full fermentation it didn't fully attenuate and he was like what's going on what's the problem and we started smelling the beer and i'm like man this kind of smells like fruity and like grapey what's going on um turns out that that a particular brewery bottle conditioned with the champagne strain um, so it just really didn't do well uh, in a beer so you always have that issue as well but that's cool and I love the idea of combining it with the spontaneous fermentation right um, and so if you've got a brewery out there that you really like their beer and you want to try to recreate it uh, and and they uh, are unfiltered and you have a little bit of bottle dregs left at the end. Like Jordan said, this is a fantastic way to do it. Um, and Alex and Tim talked about some more advanced ways uh, to uh, harvest tech or to harvest yeast from the wild. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back talking about how you can harvest and isolate yeast at home from the wild and also some best practices to set you up for success. We'll be right back. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. New yeast strains are being released all the time, whether through traditional conventional hybridization or through genetic engineering, but it's also possible to discover your own yeast at home and create something that's truly local and truly your own house culture. And there's, again, I feel like we've been saying it so much, but there's something kind of alluring about that, don't you think, Jordan? And like it's true exploration, it's true scientific discovery. I think it's really exciting. And obviously it comes down to, does it make a good beer? Um, and therein lies the rub. You know, a few years ago, Rogue Brewing out of Newport, Oregon, made a beard beer where they isolated a yeast strain from one of the brewer's beards. Oh, and they God. branded it as beard beer. And uh, they were very forthcoming about the uh, ingredients. And <laughs> it honestly, like mentally, it kind of grossed me out a little bit, but I had to try it. And I didn't love it. And so I can't help but wonder if there was this mental hang up of like, oh my gosh, I'm <laughs> drinking this guy's beard. Uh, or maybe it just wasn't a fantastic strain to begin with. I don't think it's still in their lineup anymore. Um, but, th th you know, there's a bit of a branding game to be said, you know, for here as well. <laughs> like they mentioned in the podcast, they were swabbing slugs or uh, snails, right? And so maybe you don't want to lean into that in the marketing department if you find the next strain. Maybe you don't want customers thinking about slimy slugs uh, when they're drinking uh, their Pilsner beer or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's true. I mean, there's also like an honesty component of it too, right? If you're harvesting something from a beard or a slug, you probably got to say something about that, right? Um, I don't. I think people would be really upset if they found out about that. Although, who knows? I mean, I don't know. The ingredient, wherever it comes from, as long as it tastes good, most people may not even care. Does that I mean, count as a vegan uh, product anymore? <laughs> <laughs> if you're just swabbing it? <laughs> I don't know. Non-invasive. Who knows? That's an interesting question. Uh, but Alex and Tim, uh, I mean, it was really cool to talk to them both and talk about like why they did this and 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 their story. Um, and then again, like I said, I've mentioned it several times. Uh, the, the paper itself has great step-by-step -step instructions, especially if you're a commercial brewery with access to a lab. It's awesome. I mean, they've got pictures and they've got examples 
examples of what their streak plates look like. They've got, you know, slants and they've got, they're showing you all of the different uh, prospects of this. But if you were to try this at home, that's kind of what I want to focus on um, on this half of the show and what you would need. And the first thing um, is a discussion about sterility. Okay. Um, so aseptic technique is what microbiologists call it. And that means like uh, Jordan was talking about flaming the edge of the bottle whenever you're collecting the uh, bottle dregs. Well, aseptic technique is that times like a million. Okay. It's like looking at every single potential place that a microbe can infect or contaminate your sample. And it's super important as you're growing something up or repitching um, because you need to make sure that you're actually isolating what it is that you want to isolate. But do you have to be aseptic at home? And that's where I don't know. I, I like I, I haven't I don't have enough experience of it to say like, yeah, you really have to have like a clean room and like a fume hood in order to harvest and isolate yeasts. Uh, but my guess is you can do this at home. You could be mostly aseptic, right? Just pay attention. I mean, don't sneeze on the plate whenever you're trying to harvest or, you know, don't eat with a spoon and then dip it into your media or something. You know, I mean, as long as you're taking like reasonable precautions to me, you're going to get what you need. I mean, like you did, um, uh, you know, Jordan, you were drinking that beer, I'm sure, right? Uh, I mean, b- that you were harvesting bottle dregs from and you still made a uh, yeast culture that you were able to brew beer with. Yeah, but to be fair, this was a, you know, back mixed culture with bacteria and stuff. And so sa- sourness, uh, Brett Funk was encouraged. Um, you got to be really careful when harvesting a, um, sac- a pure sac strain. And... You know, I think that really the sterility comes down to you could screw it up. And so it's not like you're going to hurt anyone necessarily. It's just that you could make, you know, get in a contamination, then you've kind of lost the project. So you got to be really careful there. Uh, The Yeast Book, actually, by uh, Chris White and Jamil Zanishef uh, has a a chapter, I believe, on this as well, on how to do this at home. And they, I think it's kind of written for both professional settings, but it kind of like gives you some steps to how you could do it at home. And I think one of the things they actually recommend is light a candle and work near a candle. And that, um, you know, I think they have like Benson burners or something in the laboratory setting, but this is something you could easily do at home that, um, what, what's, what does that do that the, the flame is like, uh, pushing the microbes away. How does that work? Uh, no, it just, it creates an updraft. It creates like an updraft because like the flame is burning the oxygen. So it's like sucking in the air. It sucks them out. Okay. Yeah. It sucks them out. It's kind of like creating a positive or a, a negative airflow, positive mm-hmm. airflow. One of those, I can't remember, but it, that's what it's, that's what it's doing. At least that's what, that's my understanding. Again, I'm not a microbiologist. I'm out over my skis on microbiology, but that's my understanding. That's what it's doing is it's uh, creating a sterile environment for those things, pulling out all of the microbes that may be in the air. Um, but yeah, that's a really good idea, right? And, and and the key here too is you do you need to be aseptic enough. Maybe that's a better way to say it, right? You need to make sure that you're actually sterilizing your, you know, sterilizing all of your equipment, and uh, you know that there's not any vector for other microbes to get in. Um, otherwise, you can't be sure that you're actually harvesting and growing up exactly what it is that you want to harvest uh, and, and grow up. And a note on danger, right? A note on like pathogens. So you can can technically go out and harvest pathogens. If you're just growing something up in wort, it can actually be bad for you. So be careful about how you're doing this, right? I mean, when you're doing your 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 drive-by sensory, make sure it is actually fermenting and that there's alcohol present and then the pH is dropping and all those sorts of things, right? Don't just, you know, put something in uh, you know, uh, some some sugary wort and then drink it and assume that it's going to be safe for you, right? I, I don't want to be like a big PSA about that. Like Jordan said, with beer, um, we've got really awesome controls, right? Um, you don't want to harvest in hops, right? So take the hops out of it. You don't want to have hoppy wort because that'll kill um, a lot of things out there that might be really interesting to you. Um, but you do want to see pH drop, right? And that pH, you want to see that drop um, during the fermentation. You want to get below 4 or around 4, 4.2. I'm sorry, not below 4, but around 4, 4.2. Uh, that's where you want to be in that range. You want to be below 5. That's what I meant to say. Um and then uh, alcohol, 
alcohol is a good thing, right? Alcohol kills a lot of those dangerous pathogenic organisms. So alcohol and pH are your friends um, whenever you're doing this. And hey, if you're harvesting for a sour beer, then awesome, right? You're going to get super acidic, uh, which is going to be great. So I just wanted to note about safety there. I don't want anybody to get harmed or or, or hurt uh, in, in doing this. But you can do this at home. And so there's a way that you can actually sterilize all of your equipment at home. It's using a pressure cooker. So there's a lot of really cool articles out there that are specifically for harvesting beer for brewing and, uh, you know, sterilizing your wort, for example. So when you make your wort um, and, and you've got just regular wort that's unhopped, you can actually put it in a pressure cooker in a glass jar with some foil on it uh, and uh, put it under pressure so that it kills any bacteria or any organisms that might be in that wort. Throw your, um, you know, uh, uh, tools in there as well, like your, your uh, you know, if you're using tongs or a fork or whatever you're using to do your streak. Uh, throw all that stuff in there and it's really easy way to sterilize all of your equipment so that's just something to keep it back in the mind back in the back of your mind right a aseptic technique um, you know and then so what tools uh, do you need and this is where it's kind of like choose your adventure and how deep in uh, microbiology that you want to get and so first thing that you need is something to swab right it, you need you need to find something to swab uh, to get a microbe off if that's a slug then you know okay go swap a slug <laughs> um, uh, you know a cotton q-tip can be your friend don't light a cotton q-tip don't put it in a flame or anything to sterilize it um, you know a cotton q-tip for the most part, it's probably going to be pretty sterile. Those first swabs aren't going to be clean in any way, right? It's more of like as you move along, as you're harvesting and isolating individual microbes, that's where you really need to make sure that you're being aseptic. But you just need something to go swab. You need some media. Media is a fancy word for wort. Or, uh, you know, if you can, if you have access or are willing to buy uh, commercial media uh, for plates and things like that, you can go out and buy plates. Just look and read the information about the media, right? If you're harvesting for brewer's yeast, you want something that brewer's yeast can grow on. If you're harvesting for lacto, you want something that lacto can grow on. Um, you know, there's all different kinds of media out there. And again, the coolest part is you can probably call up your local micro, um, your local college, your community college or whatever college is in your town, wherever you are, call them up in the micro department and say, hey, I'm interested in harvesting some yeast at home. I've got some questions about this stuff. Can I ask you some questions? And I'm sure they'd be willing to help you out. I mean, they love this stuff. This is what they do. This is what microbiologists do. They love harvesting and, and, and growing up yeasts and stuff. Uh, you know, and so you need some, you probably, if you're going to isolate, you're going to need some way like plate to grow. And there's really no getting around that, right? If you're going to harvest and isolate a specific single cell like Alex and Tim did, you're going to need plates for streak plating. Um, so there's uh, info in the article itself, but also search the internet uh, for plates. See if you can bum some off your local mid-sized brewery, their micro department. They might be willing to share some with you. Or see if you can bum some off of the local community college when you ask them about uh, streak plating. Or again, making your own media is not difficult. Um, it's it, it's very easy to do and there's a whole bunch of tutorials and YouTube videos online. Plates are cheap and media is cheap as well. Uh, the key thing is sterility, making sure that whenever you get those in the plates uh, that, that there's actually uh, that they're actually uh, sterile. Um, anything you want to add at this point, Jordan, or I'm just I'm just talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's amazing how different the game is now with the internet, right? I mean, in the 80s, if you didn't work in a laboratory or you didn't have a friend that worked at the university or something, you couldn't realistically get this for yourself. You know, it's not like there's a hobby lobby for chemistry, or at least not that I know of, right? And so yeah. um, not to mention if you live in a rural area that's not like near a big community, you're not going to have a chemistry store, you know, in your, your uh, one-stop light town. So it's really <laughs> cool to think how accessible this is. But this whole sterility thing, it makes me think of when I very first started brewing, how freaked out I was about sterility. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I remember I had a friend that wanted to learn to brew. And I mean, I was very new, had only brewed a few batches of beer. And uh, I required um, him and his girlfriend, when they came over to brew, I required them to take a shower first. Because <laughs> I was that freaked oh, wow. out about sterility, oh, awesome. and we would, me and my roommate, we would shower before our brew days. Uh, oh not goodness. that we weren't showering regularly anyway, but just this idea that <laughs> yeah. like any little speck, if it fell off your body and fell into the the boiling, you know, kettle of wort, the whole thing is ruined. Yeah, yeah. 
I remember uh, like there was one uh, one of the first times uh, I don't remember it was probably like first 10 or 15 batches or so I was chilling my kettle in my sink and I had ice I had like an ice bath in there um, and when I pulled the kettle up to like you know pull it up out of the water there was like a suction effect that happened you know like it suctioned and then whenever it like released it splashed water so it splashed like the water that was just like sitting in my sink and splashed it into my kettle and I still have it somewhere i'd have to go find it but i have my notes where i wrote down like expletive 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 i i splashed water in my beer after it was cool uh it's probably gonna make a crappy beer i'm so pissed don't ever do this you are a a expletive idiot you know <laughs> like i wrote that down in the book because uh, i was like oh my god i was so um worried that that beer was going to spoil it did not the beer turned out just fine but for isolating you do need to be careful about this stuff right or you know or don't whatever screw it if you want to live on the wild side live on the wild side too but if you're trying to isolate and grow something specific and unique and pitch a single culture then you are going to have to watch out for some of this stuff um the other thing of course that you need is some sort of when you get to this point so uh so you've got you've swabbed your thing you know um you've plated it out on some sort of plate um, you've streak plated it and again I'm not going to try to explain streak plating on the podcast because I think it's there's just so much it's so much better to do looking at a YouTube video it'll make so much more sense just google streak plating you can find it um, but uh, you've got it streaked you've ice isolated a specific, uh, you know, uh, colony that you think as yeast or whatever it is that you're looking for. Now's the time to pitch it into wort. So you need to pitch it into your propagation media, which is wort, <laughs> wort without hops. Um, and then let it ferment and do your flyby sensory analysis. You don't need any materials or tools to do flyby sensory analysis, right? That's just sniff it and smell it and, and see what it tastes like and what, or what it smells like. Make, again, make sure it's actually fermenting, but you know, see it if it smells like a gym sock don't brew with it if it smells nice and floral and flowery like tim and alex were talking about they had several yeasts that smelled really good um after they did this and so those go on to additional fermentation trials and fermentation trials are just a batch of beer so congratulations you've now gotten to the level where you've made a batch of beer and if it smells and tastes good then hey you might have something um that's really unique and so I, you can really do all of this at home. The, the, the part that may trick people up is the streak plating. But again, I promise you, if you're interested in doing this, it's not as hard as it sounds, right? It is going to be effort and work. And we said at the top of the show, this is not going to be easy to do um, if you want to harvest and and find uh, your own yeast. But you can do it. You can do this at home. If you've got any questions, reach out to uh, reach out to me at least, Jordan. I'm sure they can reach out to you too. And Google is your friend um, in terms of getting this stuff at home. Anything else to add about like you know harvesting yeast at home, Jordan? Well, on the streak plating thing is another, this is another thing that you could use for sour beers, right? Maybe you, you know, there's a sour beer that, that has this really incredible Brett character. You could actually streak out and isolate just the Brett from the dregs. And so we're not limited to just wild, you know, capture here. Um, but, you know, theoretically, a uh, bottle of Sierra Nevada is just Chico in the bottle, right? That is not the case with sour beers. And so if there's a specific thing you want to isolate out of a sour beer, this is another option to get it. Yeah, that's totally true. Uh, yeah, isolating from bottle dregs. You can absolutely do that. And this is cool. Like, I, you know, it, it may seem daunting at first, but after you've done it a couple of times, you trust me, you'll get it down. Like I've done this in a couple of different microbiology classes and streak plating is not as terrible as it sounds. Like Once you've got it down and once you've got everything going, you can really isolate and bring it and make some cool things. Um, and it starts to kind of be fun. You kind of have this like little lab um, in your in your house uh, that, that you can do things. Uh, but yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, streak plate some bottle dregs and uh, isolate that way if that's what you're interested in. Um, now, you're likely to come up with some issues, okay, if you do this. Like, nothing is ever going to go right the first time, or at least mostly <laughs> right the first time. Um, and it takes some some information or, you know, some, some trial and error and some finding information. And so one of the things that I've heard about with people, too, that they're doing this, um, they the first thing that they do is they get really excited and they swab their plate and they... Let let their plate incubate and then they look at it and they go holy crap it's a freaking forest <laughs> right it's got mold on it it's got who knows what i can't see anything i have no idea what i'm looking at um 
what do I look at? How do I know what I'm actually harvesting is bread or lacto or yeast? And again, this is where Google is your friend. There's also um, somewhere on the internet, um, I'll try to find it. And if you want it, um, send me a link and I'll try to send it to you. But it's a free book that has different it has pictures of yeasts, of brewing yeasts and bacteria, and it's like a, an illustrated guide for brewers who are interested in micro. I'll try to find this somewhere on the internet, but that's where you should look. Yeah, and I think that you want to like look for um, kind of colonies that look like they're you know doing the same kind of thing, right? You know, when we're trying to isolate a specific strain, um, obviously it's going to be difficult if a whole bunch of mixed stuff is growing together. So you want to kind of like look for the birds that are flocking together. Is that right? Yeah. So, so the whole point of street plating, that's exactly right. The whole point of street plating is when you first put it on your plate, you're going to have a huge, it's going to look gross. It's going to look like there's just a whole bunch of nasty on it. Um, but then, then the first thing that you're going to do, the isolation is like you said, find something that looks like yeast, if that's what you're looking for and look where they're growing together. Right. And then you're going to try to scoop or like, grab a little bit of that and like a, a, a the tine of a fork is a good way to do that because you can flame the fork and then you know grab like a little bit um just like on the tip of the fork uh and then grab it and then put it on another plate and that's where you're going to streak out on that other plate and and as you do this you might have to repeat a couple of times so you've got your original forest then you've got your first streak plate you might grab a single colony from that first streak plate and do it on another one and then grab a single colony from that plate and do it on another one. It might take three or four plates. You might get it the first time, but eventually you're going to have a plate that is just one organism. All of the things on the plate look exactly the same. All of the plate, all of them are, you know, behaving the same way. And that's when you've got an isolated pure culture. So you're going from essentially forest to like a single plant, right? Or a single, you know, uh, type of grass or whatever um, is a kind of a way to think about it. And again, there's YouTube videos for all this, but that's the whole point of streak plating is that isolation. That's what we talk about whenever we mean streak plating. And at the homebrew level, do you need a microscope to do this right? Um, so yes and no. Um, no, because yeast, whenever it grows, looks very particular, right? Um, yeah, it's it's hard to describe on the podcast again. So I'd go, I'd encourage you go Google um, yeast morphology, and you can see what a yeast looks like on a uh, on a plate. Uh, but it looks very distinct, and bacteria is going to look very different too, right? Like lacto is going to have is going to be like a little green with like, and it's really small. Um, yeast is also going to be pretty small too, and kind of cream colored. Uh, you know, whenever it grows. Uh, you know, and then there's other bacteria that have different colors. Mold is obviously going to look like mold. It's going to be like filamentous and gross. So you want to stay away from that. Um, but you can see what the yeast is supposed to look like. And once you've got it isolated out, you should be able to see like, okay, yeah, this is clearly identifiable um, as yeast. At that point, you know you have yeast, right? You've isolated yeast. Or if it looks like Britannomyces would on terms of morphology, you're going to be able to know like, okay, this is Britannomyces that I've got on the plate. Now, if you actually want to look at it and be 100% sure, that's where you need the microscope, right? And you can take a little bit of your, you know, take a colony, uh, put it on a microscope plate, look at it under the microscope and make sure that it matches, right? Because Britannomyces doesn't look like yeast. Yeast is very circular and round and Britannomyces is like slightly oblong um, under the microscope. So yeah, if that's how you would really know that you've harvested something that's unique is with a microscope. Do you have to do that? No, because with your street plate, you can be pretty confident that what you've grown on your street plate is a yeast because it looks like the pictures of yeast on the internet. That's interesting. I didn't realize that it was um, observable to the naked eye. And I guess once you're passing that, like, you know, naked eye test, there's the possibility that you could have a mixed culture, like multiple yeast strains, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But at the very least, you can visually distinguish between lacto, other bacteria, etc. When if we in a world where we're looking for sac. Well, and, and so the key is to you'll start to see as you streak plate, whenever you're you're you doing streak plating technique, the you'll there will be one individual colony that you can harvest. Right. So you won't have multiple strains because you'll though you'll see like one colony grow. It'll be like one mound on the streak plate. And you'll take that one mound and then put that on another streak plate and let it streak out until you've got just one mound left. After you've done that a couple of times, you're just going to get one strain, one specific um, 
uh, species, strain. You're, you're going to get one yeast. It's not going to be a mixed culture. It'll be just a single um, yeast. So if you were streaking and you had... Um you, you streaked and it was from a batch that had 3470 and USO5. The USO5 and the 3470 cultures could not create a, a shared colony on a piece of media? No. Well, they could create a shared colony, but you would see two colonies, right? You'd see two colonies. And, and so you may not be able to tell the difference between 3470 and USO5 if you grow them both on the same plate. Right. So that's a very good that's where you would need the microscope. That's your example. Right. If you put 3470 and USO5 on the same plate, they might look exactly the same to the naked eye, but they're going to be individual colonies. Right. They're going to be individual hills or little little spots on the plate. So when you take one of those spots and put it on the next plate, there's only that one spot on the next plate. So it may be USO5 or it may be 3470, but it's only one on that next plate if that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool, right? And, and so this is where you can you can really isolate and find something that's truly new and unique and and novel. I mean, this is what they did when that microclass when they found Philly Sour. They're doing street plating. They isolated this one Lachancia thermotolerance. My guess, I don't know for sure, but my guess is they put it on a piece of media that changes color when lactic acid is produced or when acid is produced. And um, it, it's, it, it's LCMS, I think is the media. I can't remember the exact name, but it's blue or green. And then when uh, a lactic acid producing uh, lactic acid is produced, it turns yellow. And so they were able to say like, oh, wait, here, weird. Here's this weird thing that doesn't look like bacteria, but it's producing lactic acid. And then they put it in a fermentation trial and they say, it's also fermenting. Wait, that's totally weird. What's going on? Right. And then this is how they find Philly sour. Um, it's just that, like just putting these organisms on a street plate. Right. And it makes you just wonder, like, what's out there, right? The idea that a yeast strain, a single strain can produce lactic acid and ethanol in a single fermentation. That is wild. You know, I was at the sour beer talk um, 2017 or so, and they were, you know, it was it was for a lay person audience. And they're like explaining the difference between Saccharomyces and Britannomyces and Lacto and PDO and explaining how um, Saccharomyces uh, and yeast cannot produce acidity. You need bacteria. And I was like, well, what about these new, um, you know, at lactic acid producing yeast strains they've discovered? They're like, we have no clue what you're talking about. That's not possible. <laughs> and I mean, it was brand yeah. new and yeah, it yeah. was so new that like, you know, professional brewers, there probably wasn't like commercially viable, um, you know, pitches for sale yet. Um, you know, they couldn't even fathom it. And so it's just like, what's next? What else is out there? Yeah, and I mean that's where a lot of those really cool work is too. You know, um, I, I is uh, in finding new yeast strains that might make uh, non-alcoholic beers, right? Right. Um, that that might not ferment maltose, but that might make a really nice, tasty, pleasant beer. I mean, it's really cool. There's a lot of work out there in uh, new and novel yeast strains, and so that's a good segue into kind of like the last topic before we wrap up. And this was uh, also something that's really important to me. Uh, from the podcast. So Tim and Alex, when they set out, their goal was to make a beer with a unique yeast, right? That tasted good. That's what they set out to do. So their entire uh, process from the start to finish was set out to isolate a specific yeast that they could pitch into a huge commercial batch that would work for a commercial brewery to make a unique and interesting, you know, terroir type beer for their area. Um, and that's what they did, right? So they, all of the steps that they did along the way were for that purpose. You, uh, you know, harvested bottle dregs from a Lambic beer because you really like Lambics, uh, Belgian Lambics, and you wanted to create that, um, uh, for yourself there in Portland. It's super important to f identify what your goal is up front, what you hope to achieve. And remember, it's going to take time. It may not work at first. It's not something you can accomplish overnight or in a week. But as long as you've got that goal of like, what are you doing? You know, and that may just be, hey, I'm just screwing around, right? I'm just going to play around and see what I can find. And I mean, maybe it's going to be crap or maybe it's not. Um, but whatever your goal is, just remember that and keep that up front. Uh, you know, make decisions based on what it is that you're trying to do. Yeah, it's really exciting. You know, it might not work out. And that's kind of part of the fun, right? If, if 
if brewing beer was simply mixing sugar and water, you know, homebrewing wouldn't be the exciting hobby that it is. And <laughs> yeah. the challenge is really part. It's it, what, what's the phrase? Uh, it's not the destination. It's the journey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And this is one of those re- things, right? If you're looking for a long-term project, like something that'll keep you interested over, you know, a year or two years or whatever, or if you're trying, you know, jaded on something about the hobby and you're just looking for a new challenge. I mean, this is a great way to do it. This is going to be challenging. It's not going to be easy, but it'll be something that's fun and potentially super rewarding if you find the next great yeast. <laughs> and at this day and age, you know, you can really change the world. Uh, don't keep it to yourself. Hit up bootleg biology, hit up white labs. One of these uh, yeast labs is going to take you up on it. And if it's good enough, you know, it could actually make it to a commercial product. Yeah, it could be cool. Or hit up your local brewery and say, hey, I've got this really cool yeast strain. Do you guys want to brew an experimental batch with it and see if they do, right? I mean, they might be willing to throw a, a, a small batch just to see if they get something new and unique. Um, and again, if you're interested in starting your own brewery, you're interested in having your own house strain, this is an interesting way to find that. You know, it's also an interesting way to see how much of a microbiologist you're willing to become, <laughs> you know, um, if you want to if you want to go down that path. Uh, but hopefully this uh, this whole thing has uh, piqued some interest. You know, it was really cool to me, too, to like stack this right on top of the GMO and genetically engineered yeast. Right. Because um, even Avi in the episode said like, yeah, you know. When you're doing genetic modification or genetic engineering, you're targeting very specific genes. But tr- true new discovery is like harvesting something. It's like going out and harvesting a new yeast strain or having some sort of hybridization. That's like true discovery, creation of, you know, um, the really, really novel and unique things that could radically alter your tr- your fermentation, not just sort of tweak, um, you know, increase thiols or reduce diacetyl or something like that. Um, it's really cool. Yeah, and we as brewers, be it professional brewers or home brewers, this is really the only thing that we can realistically actually discover at in the you know in your home, in your brewery, etc. You're not going to be able to make a new hop in your backyard <laughs> realistically, um, or a new malt, right? You need a whole farm for that, and a whole nother set of scientific acumen. This is really not that hard, and you never know what you might find. That's exactly right. Well, I think that's a great place to leave this, Jordan. Anything else you want to add? No, just please keep discovering new yeasts and uh, getting it into brewers' hands. Yeah, cool. And if you actually discover something through this and want to send us a beer, I'll happily try it. Uh, So please send that along to us. Well, Jordan, thanks for joining me in the lab. Um, And uh, Jordan and I will be back in two weeks with our next Applying the Science episode. We'll see you all then. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit Patreon.com slash Brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.